Amen. Father, we thank you for the privilege to come before you as your children. Thank you for the prayer session for Minister Ann Watson and Pastor Gagro, Barbara Gatson, and all the brethren who are on the Wednesday team. We give you praise. We exalt your holy name. There is none like unto you. And thank you for the opportunity to also have the 2019 master class session this morning. Holy Spirit, we depend upon you. We seek grace to bring forth your counsel so that it may be understood, it may be apprehended. Have your way. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Yeshua's mighty name, we are prayed. Amen and amen. We are thankful to our Father in heaven for the day, and I want to ask every one of you who is on the line, please remember to uphold the United Kingdom, that the determinate counsel of Elohim shall be fulfilled. There's political crisis that has uh, uh, come upon the nation because of the Brexit issue last night. It got to another notch, but you know what? Elohim is in control of all things, and everything shall flow into his determinate counsel. But then pray into it, asking the Father to make manifest his will and to do that which is needful to be done, which only him can do. And having said that, today... In lesson 9 of our course 101, Understanding Elohim, the Supreme Godhead, we will be looking at the mystery of the Godhead and reality of the incarnation, divine order and authority. We'll be looking at these things, and it's based on something the Father specifically said that he wanted to share this morning. As I was before him, at a stage when I prostrated before his presence, he began to speak that, look, there are certain things that need to be fleshed out, that, did, that need to make the revelation complete, and this is part of what we're going to be sharing today, and whatever we're not able to share today, we'll take it tomorrow. As you all know, uh, we don't have as much time today as we should have had, but it's all okay because Holy Spirit is in perfect control. Now, in lesson one of the study of, the, of Elohim, we saw three things in one. One of them is that Elohim is wrapped up in mystery. Number two, the mystery of Elohim will end one day. As Revelation 10, 7 says, then we shall come to the fullness of knowledge of him. Number three, in the meantime, saints need to be content with the scope of revelation about the Godhead in the Holy Scriptures, as Deuteronomy 22, 29, 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to Elohim, the things that are revealed belong to us and our children, that we may live thereby. So as true worshippers of Elohim, we need to come to a place where we recognize there is no point shying away from some of the aspects of Revelation, which those who do not understand or believe in the triune nature of Elohim cite as evidence to back up their disbelief. There are certain scriptures that those who do not believe in the divinity of Yeshua, they use it as talk scripture. They say to him, say, look, he doesn't need help. He doesn't need help. So the most realistic option is to allow Holy Spirit to interpret those scriptures and illuminate them for our understanding. And that's part of what we're going to be today. There are some scriptures we're going to cite today that people like Jehovah Witnesses and those other, what Pastor Grace calls non-Trinitarians in the teachings, she too will do a, a, a teaching on the Trinity, but she'll be taking a different approach and I urge you to listen to whenever she brings that uh, 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 teaching to be taking on the entire spectrum of different forms of people and their belief in the supreme being and she will look at all of it and then make the case through the holy scriptures for why the belief in the triune Elohim is the only feasible option. So today we are going to focus on the mystery of the incarnation which those who reject the divinity of Yeshua use to hold on to their rejection. And listen, there is a greater revelation of this very issue when we get to course 102, understanding Yeshua. So, look at this, brethren and brethren. We need to bear in mind that the primary purpose of the incarnation, the incarnation had a purpose. But what is the purpose? Elohim had in the earth dream, a son, 
who came from his bowels, so to say, Adam and Eve. He created them in his own image and likeness, sons of Elohim. But they allowed Satan to confuse them and they disobeyed Elohim and obeyed Satan and they lost their the DNA of Elohim in them, they lost it and they were chased out of his presence and they took on the DNA of Satan. So the entire history of the Bible, partly, is the history of Elohim's patience and waiting for the fullness of time when Yeshua will come to bring back into the earth realm sons of Elohim. So we need to understand that the DNA of Elohim that was wired into man at the beginning was to enable man to represent Elohim in the earth realm, to be his assigned, his ambassadors, his personal representatives. That's what Genesis 1, 26 to 29 tells us. And Psalm 115 verse 16 says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. The earth he has given to the sons of men, the children of men. Take note of that. This earth is given to the children of men. And so that is why, Womankind was created as a three-dimensional being, having a spirit, soul, and a body, as Genesis 2, 7 says. And those who are blinded by the veil of religion will miss it from here. To them, the incarnation was a plan B, which was executed in response to the promise of the seed of the woman after the fall. In other words, for those who do not believe in the divinity of Yeshua, the paradigm they hold on to is that Genesis 3.15, and I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. For them, this means that, okay, Elohim created man in his image and likeness, man fell, and so Elohim, now thinking about what to do, thought of the coming of someone. Because those who do not believe in the divinity of Yeshua, they like to think of him as a prophet. They like to think of him as a special creation, a special assignment. I mean, one on special assignment, a messenger. And they think of Genesis 3.15 as a plan B of Elohim, which we have mentioned a number of times. As has been mentioned several times, the plan of redemption of fallen humanity was no plan B. If you want to understand the divinity of Yeshua, you've got to understand that Genesis 3.15 was not a plan B. It was simply a speaking into the earth realm of something that had already been determined before Adam and Eve and the earth was created. Because we are told in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall fall, worship him. Now, if you leave that part alone, it's talking about what will happen. People, who will worship Satan through the Antichrist that is about to be made manifest. These are people whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. When? From the foundation of the world. Before the world was, the Lamb had known and had volunteered to come. Before the world was created, Elohim knew the humankind that was going to be created because of something he put in mankind called the will. And listen to this, brethren. Elohim allows man to exercise the will. That is where, where we have responsibility. You have response for your actions. You have response for your thoughts, your words, your deeds. Why? Because there's a will. No matter what thought comes to you, no matter what uh, emotions are stirred up, until you exercise your will, you will not be able to do anything. So the will is where your humanity, your personality, your personhood is exercised. And so, men and brethren, it is important to know that Elohim knew that Adam and Eve would miss it. And yet, Elohim created them. Why did he create them? Because in his original plan, there was provision that if Adam and Eve missed it, then he will restore man to himself by that provision. 
men and brethren. That's why I say there are people whose names are not whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, slain from the foundation of the world. Redemption is not a happenstance. Redemption is not a plan B. If you don't understand it, you will never understand the mystery of divinity of Yeshua Hamashiach. He didn't just happen as a function of Genesis 3.15. It didn't just happen as a function of Adam and Eve falling. He had been there before. And we are told, men and brethren, that the omniscient, omnipresent one knew in eternity past that Adam and Eve would miss it. Also knew in eternity past that you, me, us. Look at what he says. Ephesians 1, verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him, in Yeshua, before the foundation of the world, he had chosen us that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Yeshua to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved. These things have been determined. Yeshua, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit had made some determinations. Your, listen, your redemption is not a fluke. It's not flaky. It's not something that just happened, you stumble into it. There is a divine process involved before the foundation of the world. If you know this and accept this, you are not going to take your new life in Yeshua carelessly. You're not going to function anyhow. You're not going to behave anyhow. You're going to become much more, you know, you're just going to be much more uh, um, understanding of your identity in him. Men and brethren, we are told in Romans chapter 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow. Who are those? You and I. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that, we, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So sonship was necessary because of what needed to happen. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he just, also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. We need to know that these things didn't just happen. And we're not talking about the false predestination people who just, uh, you know, wake up and they, they take scripture upside down and say some people are ordained to make it, some are not ordained to hell and all that. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about no one stumbles into the kingdom by his own ability by his own righteousness, by his own re religiosity, by how much prayer you pray, by how much good works you did. No, it didn't happen that way. There was a divine com consensus of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit concerning you. If you know this, you are going to esteem your redemption highly. You are going to esteem it greatly. You are going to esteem it mightily. You are not going to play games. There's so much games in the kingdom. People play all kinds of games as if Elohim doesn't see, doesn't know. He doesn't see their heart. He doesn't know their mind. Can anybody hide from him? Adam tried to hide from him. All the schemings and games people play, they play it because they have a low esteem of Elohim. They don't know him as omniscient. They don't know him as omnipresent. They don't know that he knows all the plots in the heart of man before the plots are even hatched. Brethren, concerning the incarnation, these biblical postulations are inevitable and irrefutable. Number one, Yeshua who is part of the Godhead, needed to become a human so that his rescue mission could be effected in the earth realm which is given to humankind. Remember Psalm 115 verse 16, the earth is given to the sons of men. So he had to come as a human to reclaim the earth on behalf of divinity. Number two, all provisions for sin before the fullness of time were insufficient to truly redeem mankind from the legal lordship of Satan. Satan took legal lordship from uh, uh, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had the mantle of the earth. The day they disobeyed Elohim and obeyed Satan, uh, that day they willingly surrendered their mantle to Satan. So 
Satan became the legal god of this world. Even Yeshua recognized it. He said, the prince of this world cometh and find it not in me. He said, he that is the prince of the world judged. Yeshua acknowledged it. Even when Satan came to tempt him and said, look, all these kingdoms are mine. I'll give it to you if you just bow before me. You know what? Yeshua didn't tell him, yeah, you're a liar or whatever. No, he simply rebuked him. Brothers and sisters, Satan became the legal God of this world by that exchange between him and Adam. So that thing which Adam handed over, it made man to now take not the DNA of Elohim, which is holiness, but the DNA of Satan, which is sin. And so that DNA became to be transmitted. Adam in Genesis 5 began to bear children after his own fallen image. And from there, that David in Psalm 51 verse 5 says, I was shepherd in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Brothers and sisters, all that sinfulness of humankind, something needed to happen. And that is number three. The blood of bulls and goats and other animals and birds were insufficient to redeem humanity. Why? Bulls, goats, sheep, all those things that were used in animal sacrifices in the Old Covenant, they were of lower quality than humankind. This is animals. This is humankind, solid, three-dimensional, created in the image of Elohim. Even when DNA of sin came here, Animals, being a lower being, cannot redeem a higher being. It's impossible. So whatever that will redeem humanity needed to be something that has the capacity. One, it has to be sinless. No sin. No DNA of sin. Pure. And therefore, since all the earth was polluted, it had to come from heaven. It had to come from Elohim himself. Who alone is pure and undefiled? Angels, because they are spirit beings, they cannot do it. So redemption had to come from Elohim himself, who is pure. Then it also, whatever sacrifice that will pay for the sins of the whole world, from Adam till today, till the kingdom is restored, it had to be of the stature that was far greater. Far great, great enough to pay for the sins of the whole world. Again, this can only come from Elohim. Brother, you need to understand this. So, it is important for us to know, therefore, that the need for an aspect, a personality in the Godhead to come and pay the just price for the sin of humanity and satisfy the righteous requirement of Elohim he had to come from Elohim. Just as Abraham said on the day he was to sacrifice Isaac, that Elohim shall provide for himself a lamb. Isaac said, Father, behold the wood. Behold, where is the sacrifice? Elohim prophetically spoke. And it was established that Elohim, I mean Abraham prophetically spoke, spoke that Elohim will provide for himself a sacrifice. In Yeshua, Elohim provided for himself a sacrifice that was big enough to atone for the sins of humanity, with, that was pure enough to atone for the sins of humanity. And this is very critical. So Yeshua had to he come for 33 and a half years. 33 and a half years is a speck of time. A thousand years is like a day before the Father. 33 and a half years is like a speck of time in which divinity needed to become humanity to pay the price, to get the job done. And this is important. It is noteworthy, therefore, to know that this perfect human who was pure, undefiled, who had all that he required to pay for the price of all humans, all, everyone, who will receive by faith the word, Men and brethren, there is still room in the kingdom. Don't be among those that write off people. Don't write off the prostitutes. Don't write off all those people. Men and brethren, listen to me. Don't write off anyone. Right now as I speak with you. One of the projects of Global Missions Board is in Uganda. That project is, there's a pastor called Pastor William, the Secretary General of IMF Uganda. When I went to Uganda, we had a meeting. 
The enemy did everything to stop that meeting. The car broke down several times from Chipoga. As we're coming from Chipoga, or Kipoga, the cattle town, where we have a GMB project, also, I mean, the IMF um, UK has a project there in Chipoga. The car broke down. What, why did the enemy fight it? Pastor William has a program where every Wednesday he meets with prostitutes in a part of Kampala, a suburb of Kampala, and meets with them to give them the word. And when the father asked me to go and see him, and he arranged for me to meet these people, and the idea was to ask how many of them will receive the Lord and abandon their evil trade, and they can be assisted. Because it's not enough to preach the gospel. Go away, well, it is well with you. No, there are times action is required. And so there were two of them. One of them lost the daughter, the child, a few days before, was back on the street. But the other one had given the life before, and those two who had surrendered to the Lord and said they were willing, Pastor William and I and Apostle Paul Katangale, uh, President of IMF Uganda, we met with them, and by the grace of the Father, when they confirmed that they were leaving that business, we enabled them to start the business they said they would start. But there was something the Lord said in my hand and shared with Pastor William. I said, why not just go ahead, talk to all these people who come regularly, about 32. If they all surrender, or as many of them, let the Global Missions Board will look for funding to start a cooperative business for them. Men and brethren, I'm glad to share it with you that on April 6, 40 of them, Pastor William has got them to agree to come for an encounter with the Lord. A meeting that is believed that they will surrender their lives to the Lord. If you know what HIV has done to people in Uganda, you know how dangerous it is. But poverty is such a terrible thing that people don't mind because of the extreme poverty these people are going through. And so by the grace of the Lord, we Global Missions Board is sponsoring the conference. The people will be paid, the prostitutes will be paid what they will have earned on the street. They will be paid to come and listen to the word. And those who truly convert, they will be put together into a cooperative. I want to ask those of you watching this broadcast, who would like to be part of that, you know, Resettlement of these people into the Lord. Get in touch with teacher Stephanie Foster, who is the executive director of Global Missions Board, you know, in the United States, and begin to, or here in the UK, get in touch with uh, uh, Minister Daisy, you know, Amisu in Mission Central, and let's see what we can do. It doesn't matter. This is the kind of thing that's the heart of the Father. But that, what I'm saying is that there is room for people in the kingdom. Don't write off anybody. It's the spirit of religion. What have you done before you write off anybody? Don't write off the wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. Don't write off the religious people. Oh, even Nicodemus was a religious leader. They still made it. Matthew was a tax collector. He made it. There's in room in the kingdom. So there's a plain truth hidden in plain sight. There's a truth hidden in plain sight about Yeshua and his assignment. Those who debate his divinity do so because they are not open to the whole counsel of Elohim. They therefore cling to a few scriptures like these ones to back up their rejection. Let's now say those scriptures. Brother, listen to this. In the state of his humanity, when he was incarnated, Yeshua didn't cling to all that he was. He took on him the form of humans and therefore the form of a servant. And what did he do when he took on him the, the, the form of a, a human? He exalted the Father always. Two, he submitted to the will of the Father. He took the posture of a servant. And he said in the book of John chapter 4, I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said in the book of John, chapter 5, 30, I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, 38, he didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Even at the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was in great passion for life and death, wrestling 
with a terrible thing. In his humanity, he went to the cross. He saw the great pain, the nail prints, all that. He cringed. He saw cringing him. And he said, Father, if I had a choice, I would say, let this cup pass away. The Father that hears him always, that does whatever he wants, he was still able to put a rider, Father. Even though this is what I would have wanted, nevertheless, let your will be done. Yeshua goes church to submit to the will of the Father to finish the assignment. So he said in Mark 9, 37, whoever shall receive one of such children in my name, receive me. Whoever shall receive me, receive not me, but him that sent me. Yeshua posted as a sent person when he was in the earth realm. John 3, 34, for whom Elohim has sent, speaketh the words of Elohim, for Elohim giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. He was a sent person. Yeshua was a sent person to do the will of the Father. Men and brethren, it's so important that as a set person, Yeshua was engaged in revealing Israel to Israel and humanity, Elohim as Father, so that they could enter into meaningful, intimate relationship or family with Him. Yeshua presented the Father who sat on the throne while He was on earth as greater than Him. John 10, 29, My Father, which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. John 14, 28. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you will rejoice because I said, I go unto my father, for my father is greater than I. Of course, he was begotten of the father. So he was there talking about the father, exalting the father, men and brethren. He presented the Father as the one who reveals his identity. Only the Father could reveal his identity. Even in that exaltation of the Father, he told them in John 6, 44 and, 60 and 45, No man can come unto me except the Father, which had sent me, draw him, and I will raise him at that last day. John 6, 30, 65, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given of him by my father. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, all things were delivered unto me of my father, and no man knoweth the son, but the father, neither knoweth any man the father, save the son, and he to whom the son will reveal, like he's revealing to you and I right now by his spirit, he's bringing the revelation of these things, and these things are given to those who are simple at heart, those who have childish heart, those who are open, and those who are already close, who are intellectual, those who are proud, those who cannot receive it, the father does not bother about them. Men and brethren, it is so important that we therefore know that the day Peter saw by the Father the identity of Yeshua, when Yeshua asked them, who do men say they are? Ben Adi, he said, who do you say um, Simon Peter answered and said, thou art Yeshua. Thou art the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. In Israel, in the theology of the Old Testament, the son of Elohim is a known reality that we, is not that thing that manifestation of Elohim in the earth realm. What did Yeshua tell Simon? And Yeshua answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Brethren, it's so important that we get to know that it takes the Father to reveal. As he said in John chapter 14, verse 6, Yeshua said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father by me. If you have known me, you should have known my father also. From henceforth, you know him and have seen him. He said, you've seen me, you've seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father. And he sufficed us. Yeshua said unto him, have I been so long time with you? Three and a half years with you? And yet, you have not known me, Philip. He that has seen me has seen the father. Now how sayest thou then show us the father? Believest not thou that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. And in John 8, from verse 12 to the end, in his dialogue with the people, Yeshua was able to speak to them about him and the Father being one. 
They say, no, we are children of Abraham. We are not uh, born, we're not born of bond servants. He said, you know what? If you have been, if you are not, Abraham, your father rejoiced to see my day. They say, eh, you, hey, you are not yet 50 years old. And you are claiming you saw Abraham. Abraham. He said, listen, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He said, before Abraham was, I am. What does he say? It was that Christophany. That physical manifestation of Yeshua as Melchizedek that Abraham saw. That's what he was referencing. So, brethren, these things are mysteries. And only the Word and Holy Spirit can help us to understand and grasp them. That's why Yeshua said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. It is scriptures that testify of him. When you read line upon line, precept upon precept, you gain understanding. John 15, 26, but when the Holy Spirit is come, when the Comforter is come, rather, whom I will send unto you from the Father, I will send from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, proceed from the Father. You see again, he shall testify of me. Holy Spirit has an assignment to testify of it, Yeshua, to exalt Yeshua. So, men and brethren, the incarnation, therefore, is a mystery within the mystery of Elohim, which cannot be fully apprehended through carnal reasoning because of the limitations of the finite mind. Job 11, 7. Canst thou by searching find out Elohim? Canst thou find out the Elohim unto perfection? No, it's not possible. It's not about human logic. It has to be revealed. You have to apprehend it by revelation. So, brethren, we, are to, we deal with an issue of authority and order in the Godhead. The Godhead models relationship of familyship. We know that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He models relationship of familyship as we know. In the same way, and this has not been fully taught to the Christian church, the Godhead also models the concept of authority in relation to time. What do we mean? Under this paradigm, the divine personalities have separate functions regarding the assignment to restore the kingdom. You know what we told you the other day? It wasn't the Father that went to the cross. It was Yeshua. It wasn't the Holy Spirit that went to the cross. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. And couldn't have been there. It was Yeshua. The Yeshua was, went to the cross because of the Father who gave. He went because he was incarnated by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. Incarnated by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. So the entire Elohim was at work in the incarnation, in the assignment of Yeshua, yet each one has separate function. So, the Father sits on the throne of majesty, remaining in the exalted state. The Son is incarnated in order to be the Lamb that was slain. At the first coming, in his incarnate state, he pays the price of sin, overcomes Satan, recovers the kingdom which Adam lost. At his second coming, Yeshua will rule and reign in the earth realm for a thousand years. During this time, humanity will experience what life on earth would have been like if Adam and Eve had not sinned and lost it to Satan. And after the millennial rule, men and brethren, Yeshua will hand over the kingdom to the Father. It's like a mission. Part of the mission was accomplished at Calvary. And then he was raised up from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, as Romans chapter 8 says, and is exalted back by the right hand of the Father. Now listen, he is waiting for a day when you and I finish the assignment of the Great Commission and the population of the kingdom is brought in because that's what the Great Commission does. Through the Great Commission, the population of the kingdom is brought in on the merit of what happened at the cross of Calvary. By faith in Yeshua, they come from darkness to light. They come from sin to righteousness. And when they come in, the day the last of the population of the kingdom comes, nobody knows. But that day when the last person has come in, the end will be. And what will happen? Yeshua will rule for a thousand years. And after the one thousand years, he'll hand over the kingdom to the Father. Yes. 
divine order. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Yeshua risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since man came, for since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. Take note of this. By Adam, death came. By Yeshua, resurrection. As in Adam all die, even so in Yeshua shall all be made alive. So every man in his own order, Yeshua the first fruit, afterwards they that are Yeshua's at his coming. Verse 24, then come at the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Elohim, even the Father, then he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till the, he had put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he had put all this under his feet. But when he has set all this under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all this under him. In other words, when he put all that, all this are put under his feet, he said, listen, if that doesn't include the father, because the father sent him on the assignment. When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all this under him, that Elohim might be all in all. That's when the mystery of Elohim shall be accomplished. For now we know in part, we speak in part. So brethren, restoration of his divine glory is something that Yeshua spoke about. The high priestly prayer, whenever we hear in John 17, the, all that occurs to us is about unity of the body. Yes, he prayed about unity. The prayer that would be one. But there was something else he prayed for. He was like a man who was about to finish his mission. And say, Father, my mission is about to be accomplished. Look at what he told the Father. John 17, these words speak Yeshua. Lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee the only true Elohim and Yeshua whom you sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou givest to me. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with the glory. Wow. Which I had with thee before the world was. So Yeshua was reminding the Father. The assignment that was sent on earth is about to be finished. And since it is so, then as I finish it, as I lay it down, and finish this assignment of going to the cross, the ultimate of humiliation, emptying myself of myself and going to the cross. As I finish it, I am putting my trust in you, that you will raise me from the dead, and you will bring me back into the place of glory which I had with you as part of Elohim in eternity past. Amen and brethren, that's why Philippians chapter 2 now tells us in from verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Yeshua, who being in the form of Elohim, taught it not robbery to be equal with Elohim, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, Elohim has also highly exalted him and give him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Yeshua is Lord to the glory of Elohim the Father. You know what? The emptying was for a season, for the sake of the incarnation, for the sake of dying for the sins of humanity, recovering the mantle back from Satan. And then th that was his first coming. Then when he comes to the second coming, he will show how this world would have been if Adam and Eve had not sinned. And the glory of Elohim will be seen as the waters cover the sea all over the earth. And when he has put everything underneath his feet, then he will say to the Father, you know what? This is the kingdom. It's been recovered. The mission is accomplished. And then he and the Father will get into that realm that heaven does not want us to speculate. But we need to know these things because it helps us. So what are the implications for sins? One of them is this. Elohim modeled authority. Yeshua submitted to the authority of the Father. On earth, men and brethren, 
we need to know that authority is not oppressive. Authority is a sign of spirituality. Whenever you see anyone who doesn't want authority, who wants to just do whatever he likes, think what he likes, say what he likes, does it anyhow, you know that there is a spirit of rebellion inside, and rebellion is not of the Father. That's why he said in Romans chapter 13, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. We are all residual authorities, yet he puts delegated authorities. And men and brethren, listen to this. We got to check our consciences. We got to check our inside of us. Are we subject to authority? Do we even understand what authority is? Do we know it's not oppressive to be subject to authority? Do you know that? The Father put authority in the earth realm because just as family ship is modeled by him and we, we receive it on earth, so, so he has modeled that this earth, without authority, this earth will turn to chaos. There will be disorder. There will be confusion. And that's why, go and check, there are communities where there is no authority. It's chaos. There are many communities where you see people do whatever they like, shoot who they like, kill who they like, do whatever they like. It's where there is no authority. Amen and brethren, if we recognize this, my father was telling me this morning, that authority is an intrinsic part of kingdom life. We are not going to feel oppressed. Like Yeshua, we're going to willingly lay our life down. Yeshua lay his will down for the sake of the Father. Is that not the same thing? Do you know, in marriage, a woman and man are one, just as Father and uh, Yeshua are one. But if the woman willingly lays her glory down, you know what? It's going to be beautiful. If she insists on being herself, a separate and apart from the man, no matter what happens, there'll be confusion. So also, in anywhere, church, fellowship, network, once there's this order, when there's no order, there's a miasma in the realm of the spirit. Once there's no order, everything speaks of satanism, satanic principles. But once there's order, the love of the Father begins to be radiating. The power of the heaven begins to radiate. The glory of the heavens begins to radiate. And I pray that today, the Father would have taught us about how the Yeshua emptied himself of his glory for the sake of you and I. So that we can also lay our lives down and stop making all these plots and plans and all these things. There's so much destability in the household of faith worldwide because people cannot work together. People cannot go here. People cannot be under authority. Everybody wants his own. Everyone go to many local assemblies. Every other time you see some upheaval, somebody wants his own. Somebody wants her own. And people are plotting and scheming and all kinds of things. And all these things are being done in the name of the Lord. And people are using the name of the Lord in vain. People are forgetting that one day we are going to stand before the Elohim of the entire universe to account for every idle word. And every time we said he told us something or Holy Spirit spoke something, we've forgotten that eternity is just a speck of time away. Nobody knows what it will be. Men and brethren, while we live, let us live by divine principles. I want to encourage you to share this word, share it extensively, let people get to know the truth that sets free. The Father is still bringing revelation of many things which he wants to share with us. And until we finish, we just have to continue. And today, by the grace of the Father, I'd like to ask the question, you know, can you, number one question, are there some scriptures you can cite from this lesson that speak of the divinity of Yeshua which he laid aside. If you can think of three of it, that would be wonderful. And the next question is, what is your main takeaway from this lesson today? What is the core thing you grasp from this lesson today? Men and brethren, by the grace of the Father, we would like to also make an announcement before we pray. The Deputy President of IMF Kenya, you know, uh, Rosin Jala, uh, Rosin Angela, who, with her husband, 
they are the deputy president. I think they live in Bongoma. And by the grace of God, today is a bad day. We're going to pray for her in the daybreak with the king time. Let us pray. And all of us, let's join hands to make sure that the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of Elohim. It is a wonderful thing indeed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that has come forth. Thank you because you are at work in the life of your people. Thank you for the grace that you are pouring out in the earth realm. That grace you are pouring out through these revelations. We pray that you recruit as many of us as you have ordained who will further it, who will take it further. For you, for when you give the word, great is the company that publishes it. We pray that your name will be exalted, that we will come to a place where we understand the deeper mysteries of the kingdom and abide in them, even as your will is perf performed through your spirit at work in us. We pray for those commercial sex workers in Uganda who are selling their bodies to be able to even eat. Father, we pray that you will enable and empower the Global Missions Board with resources to resettle them in a cooperative business as they give their life to Yeshua. Pray for Pastor William that you bless him with anointing and unction to bring all of them to you. Father, we pray for the ministry and those who are going to support them. We also pray for those who teach them skills, life skills, that you will identify them and help all those whom you have appointed to be part of this project to come alongside and let's do something enduring in that place in Kampala to your own glory and praise. Thank you for answering our prayer. To you be all honor and glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.